you, worship team, for leading us uh, today. Go ahead and turn to James chapter 2. We have entered the second chapter after one month in the first. So here we are, James 2, 1 is where we are this morning. Um, I want to ask you this question by way of introduction. Have you ever met, just by a show of hands, who here could say they've met somebody famous? Met anybody famous? Okay, that's actually better than what I thought. Here's my claim to fame for meeting somebody famous. Uh, About eight years ago, I was uh, visiting a church for an internship. The name of the church was Preston Wood in north of Dallas, Texas. If you've ever been there, you know you have probably been in one of the largest churches in the United States. Uh, it, It is massive. And we're going down one hall to the next, and this guy's showing me about what I would or would not be doing at this place. And um, a couple of gentlemen come, are coming the opposite way down a hallway. One's a little bit shorter than the other, looked a little bit older, had a beard, hair combed over. And I didn't think much of it, barely glanced at him and went down the hall. About 30 seconds later, the guy looks at me and he goes, do you realize who that was? And I said, no. And he said, that was Mel Gibson. And I went, he's shorter than I thought he, he would be. And that, was, that was my first response. And that's all I've got. That's my claim to fame for, for uh, meeting celebrities. I, another one actually would be probably Pope Francis. Um, I haven't had a, uh, an audience with his excellency, but I was in, uh, at the Vatican in Rome, if you've ever been there before, and if you've ever been to a mass there, just to see what it's all about, this guy is like a rock star. And so he does the whole mass, and then he gets in his white Pope mobile, right? We know the, the Pope mobile. It goes down, and St. Peter's, the way it's set up is... It has a long road that goes all the way to the end, just going straight out from St. Peter's. And he started going down his boat mobile down, and everyone just started chasing towards him. And he was, it was, I was like, this is ridiculous. Why am I running with everybody else? And so we all start going together, and I went, it would be hilarious if he would get all the way to the end of the street and then turn around and come back like the rock star he is. And what does he do? He turns around, comes all the way back, and... I got a good picture about probably from the distance from, you know, me to you, right? And so uh, whenever I am talking with my Catholic friends, I happily remind them that I am more Catholic than they are because I saw the Pope. And so that's, that's really all I've got, okay? Maybe you've come across Christian famous. That's a whole other category. Um, if you've met a famous pastor, music artist, get, I, I am ashamed to let you know how many books I have in my office that are signed by authors who, who wrote them. Um, It's interesting being starstruck when you're in the presence of somebody who is well-known. Why do we get starstruck? Why does that happen? Why would you do that with one person, but you wouldn't do it with another? Imagine you're at a park bench, and Denzel Washington comes and sits next to you, okay? And then a complete stranger comes and sits on the opposite side. Who am I more prone to be interested in and fascinated by? Denzel! I want to hear about his movies. I want to understand how does he have that much charisma so I could have some for myself too. I need to understand what this man is all about. The other person I would ignore by comparison, right? Why do we do that? Why do we get starstruck? Why do we have this natural reaction? It's a natural reaction, but is it a Christian reaction? Let me give you something that's more realistic possibly for us is perhaps you're thinking of a Bible study that you want to get started, and as you're getting that started, you have a group of your friends, you're putting together the A team, and then you know there's that awkward, socially awkward person that's coming near, so you maybe get a little little bit more hush-hush and don't say too much, or what are you guys talking about? Oh, nothing, and right, they're not in the text group, whatever. That's a natural thing we do. We, we flock towards the people that we're most comfortable with, that we know. But is that a Christian thing to do? It's natural, but is that Christian? I want us to look this morning at the concept of partialism or favoritism. James addresses this directly, how we're supposed to act towards the other. And we're going to spend two weeks in this, actually. We're going to spend up to verse 7 today. Make sense why, and then we're going to hit verse 8 through 13 next week. I want to read for us verse 1 and following. Here's what it says. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, 
sit here in a good place. Well, you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet. Here's the indictment. He says, verse 4, have you not then made distinctions amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Real faith doesn't show favoritism. I want to flesh that out with us this morning. That if you want a genuine faith that glorifies our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you won't show favoritism towards those who are made or against those who are made in his image. Let me pray for us and we'll get into this. Lord, we so often pray and say we want a church that is unified. And yet, if we really search ourselves, we know our natural tendencies is to divide up. It's to show favoritism towards one group over another. Um, it's natural, Lord, but is it Christian? Would you show us to, what it means to know the difference between the two? Holy Spirit, draw near to us now. Give us wisdom from above to understand your word well so that we would be a church that's unified. And if we're a church that's unified, then we can be a light to a city that is dark. And if we do that, Lord, so many people can come to know you because we get it right, right in here. Lord, bless us, help us. In Christ's name, amen. If you were to go a couple verses before chapter 2, go back to verse 26, 27. This is where we ended last week. It says this. I want to read this verse. It says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. If you want the right kind of religion versus the wrong kind of religion, you have to be the kind of person that cares about the lowly, and you have to be unstained from the world. Yet You're seeking purity. Uh, some commentators have said about this passage right here that it really is the springboard to everything else that's going to come forward to us in the rest of the book of James. And, and I think we will see certain themes that pop up. But it, see how it works together with what we just read a moment ago about favoritism. In one moment, he says, care about the lowly that the world doesn't care about. Let me show you how. Look at the poor. Don't do what is natural. Care for the poor. So the application of verse 26 and 27 immediately goes into chapter 2. And by the way, when Paul and James and John, these folks were writing, they don't have chapter divisions. We, we add those in later. But you can see there's a distinction in this next section that follows. And so the way it begins is he says, let me show you how to live a religious life, the right kind. And the right kind is the kind that cares about the poor. So imagine you have a guy that comes into your church, the gathering. I don't think it's just a potluck is what he's describing here. I think he's talking about the, the traditional interpretation is a worship gathering, that we're coming together to worship the Lord. And that's where I would be. And imagine a rich person comes in, wealthy. He's wearing a nice watch, right? He's dressing the part. He looks, he looks good, right? He comes in and you say, please, sit in the pride of place. Maybe, maybe, maybe the front row or something like that. I don't know. You, know. you come sit here, right? Be here so we can all see who you are. He comes in, but another person comes into our church gathering, and that person is, by comparison, wearing shabby clothes. He's, he's not dressed well. They're just there, the motto of this person, they love that song that says, come just as you are to worship because that's all they've got. And so they, they come in and nobody notices them. Or even worse, they say, please, don't be where other people can sit, see you. Please, please sit somewhere in the back, something like that. And James gives that indictment in verse 4 and he says, when you act like that and show favoritism towards the haves versus the have-nots, you are playing the role of God. The judge. Don't you judge one another. That's what he says. Among yourselves. You make distinctions amongst yourselves and you become judges with evil thoughts. And he says this ought not to be us. And so there's three reasons James then, go, then goes and he says, here's why you ought to not show favoritism. That's the picture. We ought not to do that. Let me give you three reasons why. And it truly is, by the way, just so we know in here, it is three reasons, not just because the preacher made it, made it neat and tidy, that it's three reasons. It's really three. We're going to hit the first two right now. We'll save the last one, 8 through 13, for next week. One and two. Here we go. First one. The first reason for why we don't show favoritism is, and we don't, we don't go against the have-nots and prioritize the haves, is because that's not what God does. 
Look at verse 5 with me. Here's what he says. He says, listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to reach, to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom of God, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. And so he's saying, that's not what God does. That's the first thing here. And so when you do that, you show favoritism towards one group over the other, you're, you're going against the very nature of what God does. Matthew 11 says this, when Jesus had been encountered by John the Baptist and his, his followers, they said, are you the Messiah, the one that's to come? And he said to them, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. The poor have the good news preached to them. Jesus, who came from insignificant Nazareth, an insignificant place, speaks the most powerful message of all time, and the people who he's preaching it to are the poor. Make no mistake, God loves the outcast, the lowly, the uneducated, the poor, those whom the world say, you are not important. If you can identify with any of those things that I've just said, as I've listed that off, of the lowly right there, I want you to know in this place that God loves you. And the evidence for that is who Jesus first spoke to when he preached the gospel message, the gospel of the kingdom. This is the way God works, is he cares about those who are lowly, and he flips everything on top. Uh, that's up and puts it down. And what's down, he puts up. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 29, I've read it before, but it's worth reading again, says this. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise to, according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. True followers of Jesus in the kingdom of God do not put their boasting in anything else but Jesus Christ. Because I know they're following the one whom the world seems to say, foolishness. And yet it is actually the greatest wisdom of all. And that comes in the message of Jesus Christ towards a foolish people who he can make powerful. And so that's what he does. The passages I've just quoted, so I just gave you 1 Corinthians. I just gave you something from Matthew. I just gave you James right there. All coming together to communicate that God loves what the world dismisses. I think is another reminder of our continued assault that we should put on what we call the prosperity gospel. I have mentioned this before, but it is worth mentioning again. Not so much that I can name names, but so that we could see how it creeps up within our own hearts. It is the belief that God is essentially, we would never say it this way, but this is how it acts. A genie in the bottle, that you rub the genie and God gives you, God gives you wealth, happiness, health, all in this life right now. And so the, the word for this would be materialism. That God is here to bless you incredibly now. He has a wonderful plan for your life. And so that wonderful plan is all about the blessings that he gives in this life. And it sounds so good until you realize that's not the case of what happens with Paul. It's not the case of what happens with many of the disciples. It's not what happens with our Savior. So the prosperity gospel puts the gifts that God gives over the gift giver himself. And what we end up worshiping is stuff, not our Lord himself. And it's something that we should so watch out for in our own lives. Because if you come to the expectation that God owes you something, careful. You may have something against that smiling preacher down in Houston, but you may actually be demonstrating the prosperity gospel that you fall into in your own heart. Be careful there and see that that's not the way the gospel of the kingdom that turns everything on its head works. God cares about the poor. The heart of God is for the poor. And so how little sense does it make to 
put down those whom God elevates. I know that as I say all of that, um, that should be an obvious amen, that we all agree on that. Care about the poor, right? That, that's, we're good? That, that makes sense, right? Realistically, I know that for a number of us in here who have extended out our hand towards those who would fit in that category, you know what it's like to feel burned. Um, probably one of the most common objections that I hear towards any admonition call to obedience in scripture is you don't know my experience let me tell you a story um i justine i think i've milked the oxford oxford story for all it's worth so this is the last one i think um so we're at oxford university uh with a, a group of students and um there was a a beggar that was outside of the college that we were staying at and his name was angelus and just a distinct name so i remember that name and I walked up to him, and I was trying to do the Christian thing, and we had struck up a conversation. We were probably there for, for about 45 minutes. I learned a little bit about his life. He heard about mine. I shared the gospel with him. And he started to tell me about his daughter who was in the hospital. And um, she had been in a car accident. I believe that's what it was. And, and he said, I, just so ba- I don't have the means, but I so badly want to be able to get to the hospital. She's in another city. I need to get a, a train ticket to be able to, to reach her. And he showed me text messages. I remember he showed me a picture uh, of a woman in, in the hospital, in a hospital bed. And, you know, it, 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 it plucked at my heartstrings. And so what did I do? I, I looked to see what money I had, and I didn't have enough to, to help him. So what did I, I went to my, my friends that were on the trip with me. And so we all came together, and it ended up being about 100 bucks we gave this man. And so um, I give it to him. He is so thankful. He packs all of his stuff up immediately, and he heads toward the train station. I felt like I had done a good deed. What happened next? It was either the next day or the, the morning of the day after. Who do I see begging right outside in front of the college that we were saying, staying at? Angelus. He's there. And I walked out to him and I gave him a piece of my mind. I said, dude, what are you doing here? You're supposed to be in the hospital with your daughter, car wreck, all that, right? And he says, I went. And then I came back. And you could tell that as he was trying to stutter and get it out, we both knew that he was trying to come up with just an excuse because he was lying. And I was, as you can imagine, I was irritated. And I walked away from that encounter and I went, I'm never helping someone who's down and out ever again, ever again. So my heart became partial towards people who were in a situation like his. That was like a Wednesday, Sunday. We go up to Edinburgh and in Scotland, wonderful place. And I'm listening to the sermon. We go to church and the, the pastor preaches a sermon and he reads this right here. Let me read it to you. Jesus says, when the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels are with him, Then he will sit in his glorious throne before him. All will be gathered in all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd. Separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, "Come Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me some food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer him, Answer them and say, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. It was like the sermon had been tailor made for me and what I was going through. You ever had that happen before? It's like the preacher read your journal. And so this is what happened to me. And I'm sitting there just incredibly convicted because my heart had become hardened by having it slapped 
but just what's something that happened just a few moments ago. And so I began to reflect and reflect and think more and more. We actually, if, I don't know if you remember this, right after the service was over, there was another homeless person right outside of that church. And I was like, Lord, I don't know what to do. Like, how do I interact? With, like, how do I respond? I don't, I, I don't know what to do. So I, I worked that out. And as I worked it out, one of the things I came up with, too, with, was this. Number one, if I could go back to Angeles, uh, I would have bought his train ticket, but I would have taken him to the train station myself and paid for it. That's, I would have been more responsible in that way. I think the second thing is I've come to consider this. For some of us, we need to hear, myself included, that when we talk about the poor, the lowly, there's usually a story attached for how that person got there. What went wrong in this man's life? I mean, surely he grew up in the school system. Did he have parents? What happened to get him to be a 50-some-odd-year-old man without dignity, sitting on the side of the street like that? It began to open up my heart to care more about not just the situation in front of me, but what led up to that. I think we need to consider that when we're talking about the poor and the lowly, there's usually a story attached. There's usually, usually some sort of baggage. Usually that person has some kind of, it's not uncommon, some kind of mess that's attached to why they are where they are. And so what I would say to us is don't let your generosity, kindness, and love towards someone who is down and lowly be quenched because of a prior bad experience or because that's how all of those people act. But instead, consider this for just a moment. God chose you and I too, and we offered him nothing. When you help someone who is in a place of need, it may not benefit you at all, financially or anything like that. But before we write those kinds of folks off, let us remind ourselves that God chose us, and he did not have to. It was of no benefit to him. And I have slapped the hand many times of the extended Lord towards me, more than I can count. And so if I'm going to be the hands and feet of Jesus towards others, it should be not with the expectation that I will get anything back in return. It's the kind of same selfless love that he's first given me. In the same measure that grace has been given to you, you and I ought to extend it to one another and to others, especially when dirty rags are attached. Do I have time? I have time. Um, I was at CR on Thursday night. Dan, there he is. So Dan, like three or four times, inviting myself and the elders to CR, uh, kept saying, it's all orchestrated for, and he never would actually finish the sentence. And how he would finish the sentence, if he could, was, because I want you to come and see Aaron, what's good here? I want you to see and, and, and the vision of what we're doing at CR. So I came, Dan, and we, we listened to a, a, a pastor from Aberdeen give an excellent testimony and talk about how God had used CR in his ministry. And I walked away from it thinking about my posture from when I first got here uh, to Bethesda. If it's okay with you, can I, can I offend some of us real quick, if that's all right? Um, thank you. Thank um, you. When I first got here, I visited Celebrate Recovery, and it was probably about three weeks in, and I was trying to visit every single one of our ministry programs and get an insight and understanding of what was happening around here, get to know folks. And I had heard that line about how God can deliver us from our hurts, habits, and hangups. That's kind of, that's kind of a, a tagline that is used in Celebrate Recovery. And I walked away from that going, that is so pithy. I love that. Hurts, habits, and hangups. I got I to gotta weave that into a sermon coming up in the next few weeks. Well, over the next few weeks, um, I heard some things along the way about Celebrate Recovery. Not from the Celebrate Recovery people themselves, but just a posture from us in the church. And I went, maybe I need to pause. Maybe I need to wait. Because whether it was, and let me just be very specific here, um, maybe, whether it was the passion of my predecessor, this was his baby, right, that turned some of us off to Celebrate Recovery. I've heard that from, from a number of folks here. Or whether it's the thought of, those are the people who really need help. I'm good. Those are the people who really need help. And that's for our community. That's, and that's not for me. I put pause on how I talked about Celebrate Recovery probably for the first several months, probably even longer than that, just, just maybe out of a desire not to offend. That's honest, right? Well, that ends today. Let me say this to some of us in here. 
what I love about Celebrate Recovery and I, the folks that show up to that is there's no kind of status. Just being there Wednesday night, uh, Thursday night, some of the elders who were there in presence, you saw this too, is, is those folks clap a little bit more. The, the, there's a little bit more amens. There, you don't take yourself too seriously, right? Because the person says, I'm a grateful believer in Christ and here's my mess, right? Just out in the open like that. I just want to say to some of us in here, if there's a tendency within you to go, those are the messed up people and I'm good, you might be the person who needs to go to celebrate recovery the most, okay? That might be you. You you may not be dealing with drugs or alcohol, but you may be dealing with crippling legalism. You may be dealing with crippling pride that you can't see in your own life. And so I just want to check us for a moment and how we think about our ministry programming. Do we just think about them as not just celebrate recovery as something that is for those people out there. No, it's for us and here. It's for all of us. Let us not separate between the haves and the have-nots. Favoritism towards those who have their life together versus those who don't. And let's just honestly acknowledge none of us in here have our life together. None of us do. We all need help. It's a humble approach I think we ought to be thinking more of. Verse 6. If James has said to us so far, don't show favoritism because that's not what God does when he treats the poor, he gives a second reason. The second reason comes halfway through in verse 6. Let me pull it up for us. It says this. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? And so James is saying, when you think about those who are in places of pride of place, the rich in particular in this case, look at how they normally act. When we want to have their cell phone numbers in our phone, when we want to brush shoulders with them, when we want to be able to say who you know on your resume or who, you, who you've been talking to lately, a sense of status that may come with knowing that person, pause for just a minute and consider how these folks work, James says. At best, they're indifferent toward you. At worst, they're hostile. They're against the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If that's the case, why in the world are you showing favoritism towards people in this way? That's his point. That's his point. So see how these folks normally act. Don't do that. I want to make sure before we keep going and as we keep going that we're careful here to clarify what James is not saying. Because this passage that's in front of us has been yoga stretched beyond all belief to make it say something that it doesn't actually say, okay? On the one hand, we have the prosperity gospel. We know that is wrong, at least towards materialism and placing our faith in stuff and using God as a means towards an end. We ought to repel against that and watch that in our own heart. Something I've seen amongst evangelicals is that we can do a decent job of talking about this, I think, for the most part, in the circles I run in. But the pendulum can swing the opposite direction towards something else that I would call the poverty gospel. Let me me define what I mean by the poverty gospel gospel here. It's the opposite of the prosperity gospel that says, the only way to be obedient is to be poor. It looks at the kind of person who has been blessed with wealth and looks down on that person. It says you can only be holy if it hurts. Having less is equated with being more moral. You ever come across somebody like this where, ironically enough, in their pursuit to be obedient to the Lord, they are looking down towards the haves, and they're saying, the only right way to do this is to be the have-nots, and if I'm that way, then I'm in a better place, then I'm more holy. Ironically, what is happening in your pursuit of obedience is that you're falling into the legalism of comparison, and what you're doing there is you're saying, I'm better than somebody else. Show me someone who subscribes to the poverty gospel. I will more often than not show you someone who is actually miserable because there's no joy in their obedience. It is all about a duty that is really driven by comparison. Let's just think for a moment about how, let's talk a little bit about how God talks about wealth in the New Testament. Examples here. Joseph of Arimathea is one I like to point to. Thank God for Joseph of Arimathea who was a rich disciple of Jesus. Matthew 27 says, 
and that he had a freshly cut out tomb that Jesus, his body, could be placed in. Thank God for that man because he had the means to be able to provide a burial place for our Lord and Savior who rose three days later. I think of Lydia, a seller of purple, who went down to the river to pray with a group of other women in Philippi, and Paul met them, and they ended up converting to Christianity. And this, this lady, Lydia, and all her household, so apparently she had a, a large enough household that met, if you get to the end of chapter 16, them and the disciples met and gathered, and the brand new church of Philippi met in Lydia's household. Thank God for that woman, because without her, where would they have met? Thank God for the resources that she had to help a church get started. I think we ought to think of wealth in this way, that clearly God uses wealthy people to leverage great things for the kingdom of God and do wonderful things. This was done in the time of the Bible. It's been done throughout the centuries. It's been done right here at Bethesda Church. I look at this facility that we have. Can we just pause for just a moment and remind ourselves like how privileged you and I are the average church in the United States is less than 100 folks. It's usually about, about 75 or so right now, okay? They have the facility that we have. I love hearing the stories about how our back property was purchased. Just wonderful things of people, how they stepped in and made this happen right here for the last 81 plus years. That is not something to be ashamed of. Certain folks who were able to leverage great things for the Lord. At the same time, don't miss the warnings. That's no dismissal of the warnings to those whom God has blessed. You think of what Jesus says. He says it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. We know that one. And so we can hold both of those things together and say, God can bless. And that's not wrong when he does that, but be careful. But be careful because you can make that blessing into an idol itself. And the way you and I would encourage us, we ought to think, would be this way is that we look back all the way to Genesis 1 and 2, and that creation mandate that said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. And we ought to take the things that God has given us and understand that what you and I are called to do as image bearers, kingly priests who represent the Lord and rule over this broken world that will one day be redeemed, is that we are stewarding what he has given us. We don't own one thing. The only one who owns it is the one who says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's Jesus. And so you and I look at the th things that we have and we go, Lord, thank you for the ability to steward this well. And so whether you are a have or a have not, let us not fall into either side of favoritism that is judgmental on both sides, but instead say, Lord, what have you given me? And how can I be faithful with what's right in front of me right now? Let's be practical. Open your bulletin. Go to the back page if you have it. So we do this every single week, and this is our way of being able to say, hey, this is, this is where we're at. And so you can see our attendance that's there, and you can see our giving update. The number that's not on here, let me tell you a little bit about it, is 709. That is our annual budget. That's the, that's, the, that's the goal, okay? Month of August, you can see what giving was right there. Pra praise the Lord. We thank you for that. That is, is more than what our normal 58 number is. And then you see what our year-to-date is right there, okay? And you see where we are and where we need to get to by the end of this month. So we have four weeks left until the end of this fiscal year. And so here's what I would say to you. Um, a few things. One, this is one of the joys of being a congregational body is that this is something that we come together with, church members, and we say, yeah, let's, let's vote on this together. So I want to remind you, this is something that we came and uh, agreed with uh, almost a year ago. And as we did that, we did it for this purpose because these resources right here function in many different ways. Praise God, we get to be a part of a church that gives towards missions. A significant part of our budget goes towards that. Praise God that the lights are on this morning and this facility is taken care of Salaries, of course, for our, our staff that is here to be able to do intentional ministry. Um, we have things that we give towards here like the Elder Fund that are very precise in helping many of the things that we talked about in chapter two today. And so here's what my encouragement to you, whether you would consider yourself a have or have not. 
How is the Lord calling us to be faithful in taking care of the resources he's given us to further the work of the church to reach those who are lowly right here in our community? I give that to you. That's one very practical way we can do that. You know, right outside here, we have those, those boxes. They're not just there for show. They're there for us, especially members who have covenanted together in membership to say, I'm going to give my blood, sweat, tears, and resources so that I can fund the Great Commission. And if you want a more, a more, I can't think of a more clear way to put that. And how we give here, we fund the Great Commission. I want to see people, be, I want to see disciples be made here. I want to see the lost be found. I want to see the blind see. I want to see the lame walk. I know this is part of that process that helps with that. So I'll let the Spirit do what He's called you to do, right? And I give that to you and say, how is God calling you to be faithful with what he has given you to steward? Another thing I would give us here, church members, there should be no one who feels unwelcomed here. If you have a home, let's use it. Let's be welcoming to others. Let's be hospitable. Think about the things that the Lord has given you, whether it's much or it's little. I know this, God is faithful and he blesses the widow's might. And he blesses the faithful, wealthy person who has more, which honestly, when you look at our context right here, in the United States, I've said this many times before, we overall fit into the haves compared to our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world. And so that's my encouragement to you, is look at what God has given you, and let's be faithful in stewarding it. For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. And so the blessings that the Lord gives us ultimately is not stuff, but it is himself. And praise the Lord that he is redeeming this broken world. At the end of this story, I talked to a gentleman just a week and a half ago whose, whose, whose wife is quite sick. And he says, what does the afterlife look like? And I said, good news. You don't just go to heaven when you die. That's not what Christianity is all about. But heaven will come down at the end of all of this in a new heavens and a new earth. And what we will have stewarded here, God will have used right now to be a blessing towards other disciples being made so that more of us could be able to share in the kingdom to come. And so if God has blessed you in the many different ways, would you be a blessing towards others and see that for all of us, we are equal at the foot of the cross. We are sinners who have been saved. And if we have that kind of mindset, we won't play favorites. We'll use what God has given us to be a blessing towards others. Let me pray.